It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Pele Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Happy Aloha Friday. We have made it to the end of another week, and we're so happy to have you joining us this morning. I'm Yenji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji here on Spotlight Hawaii. And Ryan, today we are heading to the island of Maui. That's right. For the first time, we are catching up and checking in with Maui Mayor Richard Bisson, who was just sworn into office uh, a few months ago. Good morning, Mayor. Thank you so much for joining us. Actually, a few weeks ago. Weeks ago, I should say. January yeah. 2nd, yes. Yes, of course. A few weeks. Well, thank you. Uh, of course, we've had you on the show before, but never in this capacity as mayor. So we're looking forward to catching up with you. Let, let's just start off broad strokes. How are things going? Uh, as you said, a few weeks in as you settle into this role as leading the county of Maui. Well, so this is the end of our fifth week. I don't think we can be considered rookies any longer. Uh, but I will say that it's been exhilarating. It's been probably what I thought it would be, and then a little bit more. I'm really proud of our team and the uh, people we've assembled uh, to help, you know, try to get and address the issues here on Maui. So thank you for asking, but it's it's been going great. I want to start with some of the news that we saw this week. 700 gallons of diesel fuel spilled atop Haleakala. Uh, can you tell us the latest on what you understand of the spill and the cleanup and sort of what is happening next? Absolutely. Yes. So yesterday, myself, managing director, chief of staff, and my director of communications and public affairs did make the trip uh, from Wailuku up to Haleakala to meet with the uh, Space Force representatives. Uh, uh, Colonel was there at the time, also later spoke with uh, Brigadier General Mastelier, who is going to be heading the uh, remediation and the cleanup that's going to be happening there. We were able to look at the site and, and discuss maybe what uh, some of the possibilities, some of the things that could have triggered the malfunction that occurred on this uh, generator. Uh, what happens at this uh, complex is when there's a storm and a loss of power, they switch to a generator. The generator has a large capacity fuel, um, a fuel uh, tank. And something occurred where the automatic uh, uh, thing that, that causes it to stop the switch uh, didn't engage. And then their backup system also uh, looks like that also failed. So, of course, they're trying to figure out the reasons why, a couple of reasons that they have. Uh, I'll let them explain that when they have their press conference on Monday, because uh, I think they're still trying to determine which of the which option or which, which occurred. Uh, but from our point of view, um, the main thing is that they've uh, not only accepted responsibility, but accountability and that they've given a full commitment to, uh, to do the cleanup and to do a prevention plan that prevents this from happening again. I think they understand from our Maui point of view, the cultural significance and the sacredness of this wahipana uh, there in Hayakala is very special and very important to us here on Maui. Uh, that's been communicated to them. I think they've already known that and their responsibility to make things right. Uh, and we'll be monitoring uh, and get regular status updates from them. And that's what we plan to do. You know, I think when people hear, you know, those words, fuel spill, words with the military, it triggers uh, just what happened with Red Hill. And there's autom automatically a, um, just that heightened alert of being with everything that's happening here on the island of Oahu. Uh, knowing that, uh, how are you sort of navigating through this relationship, the working relationship with Space Force and members of the military uh, to ensure that there is this trust that continues between both entities, but also to uh, really gain the public's trust, knowing that this is the second time a military facility uh, has had a spill like this? Well, there are some differences in the uh, location, the quantity, and the impact of the spills. But you know, I'm not here to, uh, to speak on behalf of the military. But I think we are in a post-Red Hill climate. 
and that we understand uh, everyone is on a more heightened alert. Uh, most people just want to know how are you going to prevent this from happening again? And I think that's what our focus is on right now. The um, as far as regaining trust, of course, that's exactly why the military, in this case, the Space Force is responsible for not only accepting the uh, being accountable for the remediation and restoring this place, but also coming up with a plan, uh, whether they include us in that discussion or not. We've instructed them to make contact with those organizations that um, that help to monitor Haleakala. Uh, Kilakila o Haleakala is, is one of those, uh, Kako'o Haleakala, Friends of Haleakala, three of the organizations that are uh, pretty well recognized as stewards of that, of that particular area. So we've instructed the military to reach out to them, to make contact with them and, and get their input, obviously, on going forward. But you're absolutely right, Ryan. The trust is currently, you know, in, in limbo, I guess, since what's happened on, there on Oahu and now here on Maui. So I think they recognize that and are going to, uh, well, they're going to have to answer for it. So, yeah. Uh, you know, and when, with trust also, building trust also comes transparency. And I'm interested in the timeline. Uh, we know that the public was not informed of this incident until quite a bit after it had happened. When was the county told? Um, and is there video? Everyone always wants to know if there's video of these incidents so that we can actually see what went wrong. You know, here on Oahu, that's been a big subject of contention with the Navy. Uh, have you had similar discussions over there and also that timeline? Yeah, I'll answer that. Um, what we learned, and again, I'm sure more detail will come out in, from the military on Monday at their press conference. Uh, the spill seemed to have occurred sometime on Sunday evening, um, and they, uh, or Sunday night perhaps, but they learned of it on Monday. And the earliest I believe we were informed was Tuesday. And so that's the, the timeline on that, on that question. Uh, as far as video, I am not aware of whether there's any video of the actual um, spill that occurred, or it was a it was like an overflow, and so I can't tell you if it seeped out or how it how it uh, exceeded the size of the tank and how it came out and what kind of flow it was. I think they're still trying to determine that. We did recommend, however, that they videotape the remediation that they plan to do, so that that um, would be one step forward so that the public, speaking of transparency, is able to view the actual steps being taken uh, to correct this. And, and as someone that, as you mentioned, had went to the site and visited, uh, can you just explain what you saw? I mean, through just the naked eye and, and just your experience, I mean, was there anything that caught your attention? If you can describe what the area looked like and, and, and uh, just your experience of what you witnessed uh, during that visit. Sure. Um, yeah, and photos were taken by our team that was there. We were given full access to to take photos of outside. Obviously, we didn't go inside the facility. Uh, this is all around a, I want to say a one megawatt generator. Uh, again, an emergency generator kicks in when power shuts down. The um, well, of course, even though it was Thursday, uh, there was an obvious aroma. You know, the odor. Uh, that was that was there. It appeared to have gone into an area, and I, I don't want to estimate the size of this without, you know, having taken actual measurements. But it was uh, almost like sandbags, uh, but they were uh, the type of things you'd see in a cleanup, uh, absorbing, absorbing type of uh, uh, material that was bordered the areas that they, I guess, uh, decided was what was impacted. Uh, it's kind of on a slope. It's near a slope, so it appears that it would have gone in and seeped down. We don't know how deep, um, but the area, well, the area that's impacted is is a comparatively speaking a pretty small, small um, area. Maybe uh, if I had to guess, maybe six feet by six feet. Maybe would be the the square um, footage. 
Okay. I, you know, I know we have to move on to other topics. I just want to ask you one last question about the cleanup effort. You did mention that they have those, uh, I guess, sandbags, for lack of a better word, to try to absorb some of that, uh, those toxins. Will they be digging out that, that dirt that was affected, the, the, you know, the ground itself? Or what do they actually do to try to clean up something like this? Yeah, again, I mean, we met with our own environmental management team here at the county. Uh, coincidentally, they were in an area where we were um, on our way up there and were able to stop and talk about a couple of different options uh, that are available. One, of course, is to, uh, I think one of the things the military is going to be clear about is that they're going to do the cleanup there and not remove that from the site, you know, to another location. Uh, but I would think, you know, one option would be to remove it, clean it, and put it back, or remove it, clean it, and replace it with uh, something similar, and then replace that. There are a few options that they're considering. Um, I think that's the part they're still trying to uh, determine. So I don't want to speak for them, uh, but that's certainly one of the options. Want to move on here uh, of course uh, talking about some of the industries uh, that maui relies on and of course tourism is heavily relied upon uh was reporting 2.9 million visitors to the island of maui which spent uh, about 5.69 billion dollars uh, in 2022 uh, you know that is obviously a big part of the livelihood of the maui economy uh, your thoughts about managing tourism how do you feel about the number of visitors that arrived uh, last year and and how do you see uh, this balance between tourism, sustainability, and, and the interaction with the community? You know, you're using all the right words, Ryan. Um, certainly, um, balance is uh, is probably the key word. You know, I think like any place, we do have a capacity limit. I mean, you know, and, and I think all places do. So, uh, you know, I know there have been studies and there have been plans um, you know, on tourism destination management plans. Uh, you know, I'm in favor of following those destination management plans that we've come up with for each of our islands, Maui, Moloka'i, and Lanai. Uh, and the reason I say that is because the input has come from the community in those, um, you know, in putting those plans together. You know, we've gone through all sorts of iterations, you know, um, you know, ecotourism, sustainable tourism. Now we're on regenerative tourism. Uh, that seems to be the latest, uh, which which I understand it to be having tourists who come here that give back to the to the community in some ways, whether they do planting or beach cleanups or what, whatever they do as part of their, their trip and their visit. Um, but I think what what happens to us as residents is when there's that direct impact. And I'll use the example that I used throughout the campaign, which is the road to Hana. Um, when you drive out to the east side of Maui, um, and for people to get a glimpse of what Maui used to look like or how it used to be, and you travel those 52 miles from central Maui out to that side, um, well, there's more and more people, and they start to double park on the sides of the roads, maybe like your North Shore uh, that you folks experience there. And what it happens is it becomes a one-lane road, and it impacts people who drive out of Hana every single day to work in central Maui or even on the west side. And uh, and that's the frustration, that's the impact that people feel that is very real. And of course, they blame all that directly on tourism. Um, you know, we got to be more innovative, whether or not we require no tourists to drive in during certain hours of the day, maybe from, you know, 6 till 8 a.m. or 8.30 or 9 and not again in the afternoon to allow residents to get in and out to get to work or whether or not we require that you go in by shuttle vans where you can fit more people in as a charter. Um, you know, we've tried to discourage parking on the sides of the roads. You know, the previous administration, I thought, did a good job of putting up, you know, signage saying no parking and people just disregard or they'll take the price of the ticket versus uh, complying. And so I think when we, when we talk about tourism, uh, we talk about short-term vacation rentals or illegal short-term vacation rentals. That's also frustrating. But I will say this, that's the one topic that both the tourist industry and the local community agree on. Both of them agree that short-term, illegal short-term vacation rentals is a bad thing for our community uh, for a couple of reasons. I, I think for the industry, they think they take away from their customers who would otherwise stay at their 
at their properties. And I think for locals, they realize there are more cars in their neighborhood. There's more noise. There's more impact on their resources. And so I think they both agree that that's something we need to prevent from happening on our, in our community. So, you know, it's, it's good to have the income that comes in from tourism, but we always have to ask ourselves, is it worth the trade-off for the quality of life? Yeah. Well, on that subject, you know, the governor is proposing what they're calling a green fee, which is basically a tourist tax, you know, upon entry to Hawaii. How that will be levied and, and where it will be collected is still being debated at the legislature. But, you know, sort of as a concept, is that something that you think is a good idea on a statewide level? And are you also looking at doing more county specific impact fees, you know, like reservations atop Haleakala or here, you know, Diamond Head having a reservation in fee system, same with Hanauma Bay, Apuna Beach on, Mount, on uh, Big Island. There are a number of places that are implementing that. Do you want more of that in your county as well? Well, I'll, I'll take that in two parts. I think uh, what Representative Quinlan uh, submitted uh, in terms of the green fees were for state properties. Um, so state, state uh, trails, hiking trails and parks, etc. So I guess that would be a test case for the rest of the counties to see how that works and how that's implemented. I think the key is going to be uh, enforcement. How do you how do you enforce that happening? Uh, but for Maui, we already have a reservation system for Haleakala. Speaking of Haleakala itself, we always already have reservation system for Wainapa Napa, the cabins out in Hana. Speaking of Hana, again, um, I think what we do good here, and and again, I want to give credit to my predecessor for starting it was. Uh, we allow for, uh, we have parking, um, a mechanism now that you, uh, it's not a metered parking, but uh, you have to scan a QR code. And if you're a resident, you can park up to eight hours without a charge. And if you're a non-resident, you put in your information and you pay a, an hourly fee uh, for that. And we already have that at the Maui Ocean Center in Malaya. And I think... Um, Again, I want to continue this project in some of our county parks and county areas. So I guess similar to having metered parking, except it's uh, easier. You do it on your phone. Uh, you don't need somebody to come and monitor the meter so much. And that's, I guess, an impact fee. It, it uh, makes people think twice about just leaving their car somewhere, uh, how long you plan to be there, uh, not taking up a parking spot longer than you would have actually needed it for. And if we have it at our beach parks, uh, I think that will have an impact on, um, I guess, our capacity and, and our turnover uh, when people, how long people stay. You know, I know this is more of a question for a State Department of Transportation official, but I, I do want to ask you about the airports because they're seemingly uh, often very long lines in the airport. And that adds to the overall visitor experience, as well as for those residents uh, and Kama Aina who like to travel between islands or, or abroad. Um, what are your thoughts on just the management of the airport as a whole as you navigate through dealing with just the amount of visitors that are coming to the island of Maui uh, and with a facility that may not be the size uh, of what all the volume is coming in? I think we like keeping our, our airport the size it is. Uh, you know, there's been lots of debates over my lifetime about expanding the runway or lengthening the runway so to allow larger aircraft to come in. And that's always been met with resistance uh, here on Maui. So I think uh, it's intentionally set the way it is to try to control the number of aircraft and the number of passengers on a particular aircraft that can land. Um, you know, one of the things we struggle with is the parking capacity, again, for daily travelers and people traveling on the weekend. Uh, Man, I think the airport makes a lot of money off of ticketed, uh, you know, locals who park their car wherever they can find a spot, double parking, et cetera. So I think there, you know, probably DOT will have a plan about trying to find more parking space for us uh, that travel in and out of the, that airport. Uh, I think as far as TSA uh, getting people through, they've revamped the system a little bit here on Maui. So they, the TSA pre-check line is moved. And the regular non-TSA pre-check line uh, it has a greater capacity. I think everybody agrees they probably could have a few more stations that would make it uh, a little quicker. But I think in our peak season, we, we certainly are. We see we see that. But in a typical uh, situation, we're, we're doing pretty good. 
I um I travel pretty often, a couple times a month um, over last year and now into this year, and I've seen a big difference uh, out of our Maui airport. Um, but I think when we're in peak season, you can you can feel it and you can definitely see it. So, uh, but I don't think anybody wants to expand the airport for that. Maybe expand more TSA lines. One of the things that all the counties are now facing uh, are concealed carry permits, um, of course, with the Supreme Court decision last year that is now uh, making way for residents across the islands to carry guns on their person. The counties now uh, are each specifically trying to figure out what are those sensitive areas and if there should be limitations as to where citizens can carry guns. Do you think that this should be done, you know, county specific? We know Mayor Blangiardi is trying to get the city council to try to push through something to restrict, you know, where guns can be uh, carried here in the city and county of Honolulu. Are you hoping for something similar on Maui? And, and do you think that the state legislature should pass something that would make a statewide standard and not have it be county to county different? Well, right now it's county to county different anyway, uh, without this this law. Uh, without this change in the law, it's already been a county by county. And I think that's a wise system to have because every police chief should know who is carrying a firearm in their community. And the way it's set up now, you have to get permission from each respective police chief. And that's so that they can keep track of that. If you allow it statewide, the chief on Maui won't know how many were issued by the what you could find out, but wouldn't know how many of the big island people are on Maui with carrying a uh, concealed firearm. So I think for safety reasons, it's a good idea that it stays within each county. I know people would like um, a statewide, and I think the reason given is for uniformity. Uh, but I think unless you're going to have a statewide person monitoring it, it falls on the, each police chief in each county. So I think they should have, if they're going to have the responsibility and the accountability, I think they should have the ability to, to issue those. I think the, you know, as strict as gun laws are, and we have clearly have the strictest gun laws in the nation, we also have the lowest number of gun-related incidences in the country. So I think our laws have shown that they've worked. I think for... You know, with this change, I think what we should be most concerned about is not the ability to carry, but the judgment on when to use that. I think that's what uh, I don't see written into the law. I see, I see that they're required that you go get your permit, I mean, that you go get your uh, your license, that you went to the range or, or, or some, uh, some a proof that you were trained by someone, you went to the shooting range or you got a... Um, you went through a class, I guess, and maybe even your accuracy. But I think the two important things about anyone who's going to carry a firearm is number one, that you can hit what you aim at, that you're accurate. But number two, even more important, is that you have the judgment of knowing when to pull it out and when not to. Um, I think, you know, recent, well, it's been some time now, but the DD case probably gives us a great example of someone who was trained, qualified, authorized to carry and still ended up taking a life in an after hours um, event at, the, at a fast food restaurant because the person who's carrying the firearm knows they have the advantage over anyone else who doesn't have one. And rather than talk it out or fight it out with fist or something else, they know they can go right to the, they can pull out the stopper at any time and end it. And I think the person who does that should have should have good judgment um, before they do that. And so that's the only part I think that's missing. I don't know how you judge that. I don't know how you test for that. But I think we we think our, we give that authority to police officers. And I speak at a lot of police graduations, police recruit graduations, and I always talk to them about this. They're the only, um, you know, law enforcement, the only occupation where we give them the right to take life um, because we think they've got the training, but mostly the judgment Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they don't. And now we're going to say every citizen who wants to can have one. And we're going to assume because you can buy one and own one that you know when to use it. And I think that's what's dangerous about not having that clarified. Well, I want to say on this topic, uh, to some degree, and uh, I'll pivot a little, but you know, want to talk about your relations uh, and working relationship with the chief of police there. We know that he has 
uh, he's new, to, somewhat new to the job like yourself, uh, having a year now under his belt. But he has received some criticism about uh, his management styles and the, and the way that he operates his department. Uh, have you had conversations uh, with the chief of police there and, and your overall thoughts in this working relationship moving forward uh, and in hearing some of the concerns of some of the officers he manages? Yeah, I've absolutely met with the chief. I met with him before I became mayor and I've met with him a few times since I've taken office as I have with uh, just about every one of our directors. Um, you know, I always believe uh, my own background coming from the background of a prosecutor and a, and a judge handling criminal ca cases, that it's important that we be supportive of our police chief, wh wh wherever, whatever their background, wherever they came, however they got um, selected for the job. You know, the police commission had the responsibility of doing the vetting. Um, and I think, again, whatever my personal opinion would have been uh, is, is irrelevant. I think what's important now is mayor that we support not only the chief, but all the men and women in the department uh, so that they can do their job. You know, again, the, the post George Floyd climate that we're in requires us to, to be, um, you know, unify and have that trust in our department. And I think it starts with that positive relationship. Uh, again, the chief uh, has been responsive to myself, you, you may not know this, but my managing director is a former uh, deputy chief of police here in Maui, 25 years, Kekuhaupio Akana. And so we have a strong uh, background in public safety. And that's, of course, I think the number one, the number one responsibility of a mayor is to, is to provide public safety for your residents and your visitors. And I think the chief is aware of that. He understands that very clearly. Uh, so in very broad terms, I, I just want to say that I, I support the chief and his department and that it's my goal to, again, keep our community as safe as, as we can. We are almost out of time, but I do want to stick with first responders and ask you about the Maui firefighter, the young man who was injured, swept away through that storm drain uh, during the recent rains on Maui. Can you tell us, you know, fr from what you know, how he's doing and, uh, you know, just just how things are going with his recovery? Yeah, Trey Evans Dumaran is a, a remarkable young man with the department for just over three years. Uh, very unfortunate situation that occurred, but I got to say he's he's holding his own. Uh, I know his family is is obviously with him, very supportive. The entire fire department, and I would say probably our entire community, is rallying around him. Uh, considering what he experienced and what he went through, uh, he is still. He is, you know, the term uses he's fighting, but in it, things are positive, things are promising, uh, things are going in the right direction for him. And uh, the big thing I want to say is his family has set up a GoFundMe page that has gotten quite a bit of response already. And I would encourage people of Maui and actually anywhere around the state to to contribute to him and, and what his needs are going to be. Uh, but there's strong support for him. Again, things are promising. Uh, yeah, there have been some there have been some positive uh, uh, changes that have occurred, and so we're very very encouraged that that he's uh, again doing well. Well, that's definitely great to hear. Uh, we're almost out of time, but before we let you go, just a final word this morning uh, that you may have for uh, residents of Maui County uh, as, as you enter now your sixth week, I believe, going in next week. But uh, your thoughts about just being in this role and moving forward as the new mayor of Maui County. Yeah, it's been everything I thought it would be and more, of course. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that you do day to day. And then, of course, the things that you can't plan that pop up. Um, you know, I think the message for me is for us to be one Maui, you know, one Maui Nui, Maui Molokai and Lanai. I, I would, you know, encourage us. You know, I, I plan to work in a very respectful manner with our county council. I plan to, you know, be responsive to them and, and I treat them with respect. And, and I would expect the same in exchange. Uh, I, I come from a different background than most people who become mayor. I think I'm the first non-council member to become mayor of our county as the eighth mayor, uh, ninth, eighth or ninth mayor, uh, if you count Mayor Arakawa having served two different uh, times. But we, um, yeah, we're looking, we put together a really positive team, a solid team of directors and deputies and chiefs of, and chiefs of different divisions. And so... I think mostly I just want Maui to uh, to know that we're we're working our best to put together a good team and and to serve them the best we can. And I'm very very lucky and very blessed to be in this position.
And I understand that. Maui Mayor Richard Bisson, thank you so much for spending some of your morning with us and answering our questions. We hope to see you again on this program very soon. Thank you so uh, much. Yes, thank take you. care. Uh-huh. Great to hear from him, Ryan. Uh, we got an update, if you missed it at the top, about what happened at Haleakala. Interesting to hear, uh, you know, his assessment. He got to go there yesterday, actually see the, the spill itself. Um, and he did note that there are, that, you know, it's still an active site. He could smell the fumes, he said, uh, this many days later. He did say that, you know, in terms of the timeline, there is a lapse between when the spill occurred and when the county was notified. They believe that the spill happened Sunday into Monday. They were aware of it on Monday. They did not notify the county or the public until Tuesday. Uh, He does not know if video does exist of the incident itself, but he said that he did advise those in charge to please film and videotape and share video of them doing the, you know, the cleanup uh, to really encourage transparency of what's happening up there. Yeah, and you really heard his uh, understanding, he said, uh, of living in this post-Red Hill culture now where uh, these types of situations are alarming, be it, uh, you know, a s- small spill or to the magnitude of what has happened here on the island of Oahu with Red Hill, uh, and that there will be uh, accountability for the military and for Space Force uh, to have to answer some of these questions and to ensure that this does not happen again, especially on a cultural uh, and a sacred spot like Haleakala is for many in the native Hawaiian community, as well as the role that that mountain plays just for the Uh, you know, the island as a whole with many visitors visiting there. And so there is a a lot of concern about uh, how that is managed as well. Of course, uh, this is during a time where talks continue on with the 30 meter telescope uh, on the big island. And so we'll see how uh, this recent spill on an area and a landmark like Haleakala may impact uh, things moving forward, both at Red Hill and at TMT. But the mayor saying that, uh, that they will continue to hold the military accountable and continue to have those discussions also noting that there is an expected news conference that will happen uh, early next week, likely on Monday, to discuss in more details uh, how the cleanup efforts are going and what exactly happened there on the mountain. Yeah, we will be watching that. Also interested to get his thoughts on tourism management. Uh, you know, he's saying that they are looking at all options on site-specific uh, impacts and perhaps expanding their parking restrictions, trying to widen out some of the uh, parking fees that they have for visitors, expanding that perhaps to larger county beach park areas beyond what they have already, and perhaps limiting travel on the road to Hana so that the people who actually live and work there uh, can get in and out with more ease because he says that, you know, the traffic congestion we've heard about for years has really hit a breaking point. So perhaps they will limit traffic in the morning and in the afternoon to give residents there a little bit of freedom to come and go. Um, And also interested to hear what he had to say about guns. You know, you can't really legislate uh, what he was talking about, good judgment, but he does feel like that is a missing piece in the concealed carry permit law. Yeah, and also with his background uh, being and coming from, you know, a judiciary background and knowing some of the specific language that is involved in that, uh, but also saying that each county is having to navigate through these changes uh, uh, separately. Uh, But we'll we'll continue to watch this. We encourage you, if you miss any part of this interview with the mayor, to go back and watch. We covered a few other items on there, Uh, but always great to hear from him. Uh, Again, this is the first time that we're hearing him in his capacity as mayor saying only five weeks into the job, but uh, being challenged already with a number of things. Uh, but he said he's loving it and, and loves the responsibility. So we look forward to more conversations with Mayor Bisson in the future. On, on Monday, we'll be speaking with somebody in charge uh, and has been tasked to help tackle the housing crisis here in Hawaii and someone who has made headlines over the last few days. Yes, perhaps not in the area that she wishes to be focused on. We're talking, of course, about Nani Madero. She is the state's first ever chief housing officer tasked by the Green administration to really try to tackle the affordable housing issue from all angles. We are very interested to hear her plan and what she sees as her responsibility in this role. But of course, she has been um, in this conflict, if you will, with Senator Kurt 
Kurt Favela, uh, some of the comments that he made, uh, inspiring the governor to pen a letter to Ron Kochi saying that, you know, the things that he is saying about Ms. Medeiros are inappropriate and demanding a response from uh, the Senate. So we will see how that is all unfolding. Uh, so a lot to catch up with her. We really want to talk about housing policy and what she hopes to do in that office. But of course, uh, the recent news is hard to ignore. So we will ask about all of it. And we hope you will be here for that on Monday at 1030. Have a great weekend. We'll see you then. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.